Hello, and welcome to our third lecture in our fifth module in this uh, online series in cognition. Last time we talked about the levels of processing effect as a, a way of looking at different ways of encoding into long-term memory. We're going to go a little bit further and go beyond just basic levels of processing and look at what we call different types of elaborative processing. We'll start by talking about what elaborative processing is, and then I'm going to take you through a series of different types of elaborative processing mechanisms. Uh, the thing I hope you get out of this lecture is thinking about how you can apply uh, what I'm talking about today to anything you might be trying to learn because these are really particularly effective strategies for trying to remember something later. So let's start with talking about what we mean by elaboration. Well memory is better if we connect what we are trying to learn to other information, particularly other information that we already know. So this is related to depth of processing. Semantic processing causes greater elaboration by activating connections in semantic memory. So if I ask you to think about whether an apple is a fruit, vegetable, or animal, you have to think about what an apple is. It grows on a tree. We think of it as a fruit. We distinguish it from a vegetable. Um, and we know it's not an animal. So we connect it to all of those different kinds of information. Uh, whereas if I ask you if it has two syllables or not, you go apple, and then you don't think about what apple means. Um, but when we think about its meaning, we connect to all of that other information, that richness of our semantic memory, is what we get a chance to connect that, th that thing we're trying to remember to, like the word apple. So that's why depth of processing is a type of elaboration, in particular that kind of semantic process. So we're going to talk about these six different ways to think about elaborative processing or different types of elaboration. And we'll talk first about the self-reference effect, then we'll talk about a uh, relatively newcomer to this field, uh, survival processing, which is a interesting type of level of processing brought to us by Jim Nairn. We'll talk about the generation effect, uh, a lot of work done there uh, by a number of people, in particular Neil Mulligan, and we'll talk about the enactment effect, organization, and organization, sorry, and then finally we'll finish up with distinctiveness, which is some, uh, an area that I've done some work with, along with Mark McDaniel and Ed Delage. So let's start with the self-reference effect. The self-reference effect is when uh, we link to be learned information to personally relevant information about oneself. This creates a strong type of encoding. It's a really great demonstration um, that Timothy Bender uh, in Missouri has come up with on the self-reference effect that you can actually go online and try. So I highly recommend that. Um, so what we do when we link to be learned information to personally relevant information is it ties us to so many different things. So if you look over here, let's take a look at the data first. Um, and there's some interesting phenomena with uh, the levels of processing data in which if the answer is yes, is in capital letters, or rhymes with versus no, it's not. That actually changes the level of processing just a, a smidge, as we like to say. Um, but not enough to really uh, fuss about, in particular only at these lower levels of processing. Uh, when we get up into the higher levels, it's, it's, marginal, it's a marginal difference. But you can see, is it in capital letters? Is it, does it rhyme with? Does it mean the same as? So does um, liberty mean the same as freedom, for example, something like that? Um, or does it describe you? And you can see performance is quite high here in the does it describe you. So this might be a word like generous. And so when you make that judgment about whether or not it describes you, you have to think about, well, have I been generous lately? And so you'll think, well, let's see, my roommate wanted to borrow money this morning, so um, I just gave him $5 and told him to keep it. I was at uh, the cafeteria today, and um, somebody in front of me didn't have enough uh, swipes left on their card to have lunch, so I swiped for them. Yes, I, I would consider myself generous. Um, and then the next one might be, are you moody? Well, no, I don't, I don't remember being moody lately. Uh, or maybe you think, oh, well, you know, my friend so-and-so, always mood swings, bad moods, good moods, you never know what kind of mood. They're moody, but I'm not moody. Well, if you think about what just happened there is that's a rich amount of information so that later on when you're asking people ask you well, what was on that list you're like I oh, will generous because I remember that and then Moody was on there because 
Um, I remember thinking about my friend and how moody he is. Um, was apple on the list? Well, I remember thinking about fruits versus vegetables. Yeah, it was on there. Um, what rhymed with dog? Mm, log, hog, frog. So you can see that self-reference effect really is a rich way in which to try to remember something. So you can use this uh, in your own studying. When you think about, all right, how can I make this self-referent? This it, it won't always work, right? Um, but there are lots of ways in which you can use this sort of self-reference to to try to learn material. Um, so Nate, uh, Nate Silver, for example, is uh, the uh, guy who runs the 538 blog. Um, very famous statistician. And he was really interested in sports, and he got interested in stats because he was so interested in sports and sports statistics. In fact, Moneyball is um, about him. So uh, he used his passion to try to learn statistics. So he was able to take statistics and apply it to his life. Um, in psychology, this is often easy, particularly when you take abnormal psychology, because then you can just diagnose everyone you know, and you remember borderline personality disorder, because that's your friend Katie, and uh, narcissistic personality disorder is your friend Chris. Um, all of these things just fit right in with um, people that you know. And so you can use this kind of self-referential processing um, to learn information. So it's a really rich source of information, and I highly encourage you to use it. All right, that gets us to survival processing. And survival processing is, is kind of a new uh, player in the field. Uh, and the basic idea is that if you process information in terms of its value to survival, um, is an effective encoding strategy in some of these kind of list learning experiments. So let's take a look at some of the data here. Um, the ratings were, is it pleasant or not? Would it help you survive in the city? Would it help you survive in the grasslands? Or something like that. Um, and you can see that survival in the grasslands um, is a little bit more effective than the other types of um, processing. And so uh, what Jim Nairn has tied this to is uh, the evolutionary advantage for thinking about what we might need to survive, um, and that is what leads to this sort of deeper level of processing. There are other people who say, it's well, it's nothing, nothing to do with evolution, it just isn't just another rich way of processing. And so uh, this might be useful for you in terms of a new way to think about the sort of richness of how to encode information and think about it. And it's about tying things to other things. Um, a person I know, Matt Rhodes at Colorado State, has done this with um, sort of the zombie apocalypse. What do you need to survive zombies? That sort of thing. So ways in which you can just creatively encode information with this kind of rich level of survival processing. Lots of work done on the generation effect. Um, this is a well-known phenomenon. Uh, my friend Neil Mulligan has done a great deal of work here um, investigating how the generation effect works, um, ways in which it uh, differs from other types of memory. But the basic idea is memory is better when we generate associations or ourselves than when we read them. Um, so the basic, at its most basic level, if we were going to do a basic cued recall or a cued associative task is what we would say, um, we might give you hot and the first word that comes to mind might be cold. Uh, versus giving you dog and cat. So these are associated words, obviously. And the one that's that you generated, um, cold, for example, in this case, uh, you would be much better at remembering later on than ones that we provided for you uh, in a pair of associate like dog and cat. And uh, again, a great deal of work done in this area um, where generated words are Re uh, <laughs> remembered better than red words. And this relates to a number of different phenomena that we'll talk about, but things that you generate yourself are really important. So self-generated versus externally generated or red items. So you're going to read items that means somebody else generated them. But ones that you came up with yourself are a far richer form of uh, memory formation and memory encoding. So to apply this to your own studying, Generating your own examples, generating your own questions, your own ways of thinking about it, your own definitions. All of this comes from you, and you're much more likely to remember it later. There's some belief even that handwritten notes are a form of generation. Um, that is, when you write things down, you're generating them internally. The data on that is um, 
just past equivocal, I guess I would say. So uh, I would say if writing down things, uh, handwritten notes works well for you as a memory strategy, then do it. Uh, one of the things we know is that retrieval is an important way in which for you to try to uh, come up with, or sorry, to encode information. That is, when you retrieve something, you generate a new memory trace. So doing things like generating your notes from memory, generating definitions from memory, uh, gets both generation effects and retrieval effects. And so these are really, really rich forms of uh, ways in which to improve uh, memory performance. That gets at the enactment effect. Um, another interesting phenomenon where we see that if we compare um, performed or enacted tasks are better remembered than those that are read about. So for example, if you um, read about a series of dance steps versus performing the dance steps, you're more likely to remember those ones you performed later. Um, so hands-on, this is kind of a hands-on effect. Uh, trying to figure out how you might use this as a memory strategy. I guess if you came up with something you could enact to try to remember something, um, certainly if you're trying to memorize a script or uh, think about a novel, acting out what's going on in it might work. Um, thinking about how if you're trying to learn like a mental disorder, could you enact, pretend like you had that disorder? Something like that. I don't know. Be creative. Uh, but in this task, in this case, it's again something um, where you watch somebody do something and then do it yourself, that sort of thing. Uh, organization is another way in which you can establish elaborative processing. And essentially what you have to do is order material in a logical way. So impose a meaningful structure on to be learned material. Uh, so you're going to try to organize the information, get it in a, some sort of structure, and that organization then can lead to deeper processing. This is particularly important for instructors who are not well organized, I guess is the way to put that. So when you're thinking about um, some of your instructors, and I know some of you have instructors that uh, don't teach uh, in an organized way. Um, you may have noticed that I teach from an outline, and I do that on purpose because I want to capitalize on this kind of organization. And what I tell my students is use this outline as, as a starting point, and then when you read information, um, when you read the textbook, and when you read something uh, outside reading, or you just find an article that you think is interesting, a news article, you can jot notes into this outline. Um, when I teach graduate classes, uh, graduate students have a great deal more external reading, and I always tell them, use this structure as a place to hang information from those readings, so you can use it uh, to organize. Many of you, as I said, have less than organized uh, professors who lecture in a perhaps more conversational style. Some might say conversational, some might say rambling. I ramble a bit to myself, um, but what you need to do, uh, or what is probably best to do, is impose order on that chaotic structure. Uh, outline uh, chapters, look at your notes that you've been jotting down and try to figure out how it ties together, come up with some sort of organization. If you, go, if you plan on going to law school, or any of you who've gone to law school or go to law school, outlines are the um, currency of law schools. You will uh, create outlines, you will buy outlines, you will trade outlines, you will steal outlines, you will do all sorts of outlining because you have these enormous classes where you have tremendous amounts of information to try to remember. And the only way to get all that information in is to organize it into an outline. And that gets us to distinctiveness. And distinctiveness is another uh, great uh, mnemonic technique. By focusing on the distinctive aspects, that causes improved memory performance relative to less distinctive items. Uh, the thing with distinctiveness is it has to be different to be distinctive. Not everything can be distinctive, if that makes sense. Um, we'll talk uh, a little more perhaps later in the term about how some of this all ties in together. So there's a thing called the item order hypothesis. Uh, and one of the things we find is that uh, distinctive items stand out amongst common items, but if they're all distinctive items versus all common items, the distinctive items are 
are not better remembered because everything is trying to stand out and it's all fighting for that attention. So one of the things we know from uh, the literature is that distinctive items capture more attention. So the things like bizarre items or funny items um, or different colored items or um, uncommon words, bizarre words, that sort of thing, uh, they're more distinctive and so we're more likely to remember them later. And this all started uh, with what's called the von Restorff effect. Uh, where we get an advantage in memory for distinctive items over less distinctive items. They just stand out in memory. And this works for co color, for example. Um, if you have one word in blue and a list of items that are all in red, the blue item will be remembered better than the other items because it stands out. Uh, so this, again, thinking about things in a distinctive way. What's uh, a distinctive example? What's a good way to picture it? Um, what's a strange way to think about it? It's one of the reasons why um, I oftentimes use some extraordinary examples in my courses. So things like head injuries, how, do, how does that help us uh, to remember? In particular, sort of really strange head injuries like Phineas Gage, um, because they're distinctive and they're unique stories and they help us to remember things better. So uniqueness and distinctiveness is a really uh, another great way of trying to remember things uh, later on. So think about ways in which you can make them distinctive, make them stand out in memory. So this is a, a quick introduction to different types of elaborative processing. Uh, hopefully you'll find this uh, effective. Uh, later on in a later module, we're going to talk about effective study strategies and we're going to come back to some of this different type, these different types of elaborative processing. But for now, we're going to um, move on and in our next lecture, we're going to talk about encoding retrieval interactions. In particular, we're going to talk about what's called the encoding specificity principle.